Good evening. I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Newport News School Board for Tuesday, March 21st, 2023. On behalf of the members of the school board and Dr. Mitchell, I welcome each of you present this evening and those who are watching on TV and online. A quorum is present to transact the business of the school division. We will begin tonight's meeting with the invocation and the pledge to the flag. Here to do the honors are two students from Katherine G. Johnson Elementary School, Braylon Cecil and Caden Cobbs. Yes, we'll clap. <laughs> First, Braylon will come forward and deliver the invocation. <laughs> Hello, my name is Braylon Cecil and I'm a fifth grader at Katherine Johnson. I am also a member of Anchored for Life and a part of the award-winning Cribs of Thunder drumline. Anchored for Life is where we welcome new students, help students who are moving, and give deployment camps to military students. Next April, next month is April, month of the military child. I will now read a poem to honor military students everywhere. Dandelion seeds float across the sky, shifting in the wind, unsure where they will land. Blooming in many places, adapting to new climates and soils. Military children are much the same, moving to new towns, missing family members overseas, adjusting to so much change, amazing resi resilience and strong. Wow. Next we have Caden who will come forward and deliver the pledge. Kaden, you can tell us a little bit about yourself as well. Hello, my name is Kaden Cobbs, and I am a fourth grader at Kathleen Johnson Elementary School. I am a part of Anchored for Life and their award-winning Crimson Thunder Drumline. Now please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. So thank you both for participating in tonight's meeting. You did a wonderful job supporting our students uh, tonight or their families and school families. So please stand and be recognized. And the board really does appreciate the encouragement you have given these students. And we thank you for bringing them, driving them here this evening uh, for the uh, tonight's meeting. So thanks, thank you very much for that. So next item on tonight's agenda is uh, school board recognition. So Dr. Mitchell, please join me at the podium. Good evening. My name is Tracy Brooks, and I'm special assistant to the superintendent. And it is my honor and privilege to join all of you in recognizing some outstanding student athletes this evening. Okay. Are we ready? Okay. All righty. On March 11th, the Woodside High School Board's basketball team earned the 2023 Virginia High School League Class 5 State Championship with a 54-52 victory over Patrick Henry High School's team at the Virginia Commonwealth University Siegel Center in Richmond. Yay! Yes, it is. So tonight we are extremely honored to recognize these talented student athletes. Please join me in congratulating the following students and we ask that you please come forward. Silas Barksdale. Silas, if 
she would come here. Jermaine Dietrich. Your main. Christian Greenlaw. <laughs> Travis Hamilton. <laughs> Terrence Hayes. Mikhail Jenkins, <laughs> Devin Jones, <laughs> Rodney Larkins, <laughs> Jameer McIntyre was not able to join us, is that correct? Okay, but he is here in spirit. Jacoby Reed. <laughs> Trevor Smith. <laughs> Messiah Wells Stevens. <laughs> and Saquon Wells. Got some more folks coming out. So, ready? Please also join us in congratulating head coach Stefan Wells, who was named the Virginia High School League Class 5 Basketball Coach of the Year. And the assistant coaches who round out this great team, Mr. Chandler was not able to attend, is that correct? Okay. Mr. Jeff Hall. O.J. Jackson, who was not able to attend. And Octavius Langford. Now, rounding out this group were also two team managers who were not able to attend, Micaiah Cooper and Lily Mason. So let's give everyone a great round of applause. Now, the school board and interim superintendent have prepared a special resolution for these student athletes, and it reads in part, a resolution of recognition honoring Woodside High School boys basketball team as the Virginia High School League Class 5 state championships, whereas the Woodside High School boys basketball team earned the 2023 Virginia High School League Class 5 state championship with a 54 to 52 victory over Patrick Henry High School's team on March 11, 2023, at the Virginia Commonwealth University Siegel Center in Richmond, Virginia, whereas with this victory, the Woodside Wolverines won their first state title in boys basketball in almost two decades after the Wolverines' back-to-back -back state titles in 2004 and 2005 and finished their season with an outstanding record of 23-5. And whereas the Woodside team comprising of Silas Barksdale, Jermaine Dietrich, Christian Greenlaw, Travis Hamilton, Terrence Hayes, Mikhail Jenkins, Devin Jones, Rodney Larkins, Jameer McIntyre, Jacoby Reed, Trevor Smith, Messiah Wells Stevens, and Saquon Welsh captured the state title after a competitive game, which ended in a buzzer beating shot by Christian Greenlaw. <laughs> and whereas the athletic talent displayed by this team is due in part to the efforts of head coach Stephen Walsh, who is named the Virginia High School League Class 5 Boys Basketball Coach of the Year, and assistant coaches Nashiel Chandler, Jeff Hall, 
O.J. Jackson, Octavius Langford, and managers Makaya Cooper and Lily Mason, the support of the team's family and friends, and a host of other fans and supporters. And whereas the hallmarks of the Wolverines from the opening game of the season to participation in the championship were a testament to athletic ability, good sportsmanship, and scholarship demonstrating that the team is determined and focused and now therefore be it resolved that the Newport News School Board congratulates the Woodside High School boys basketball team on their state championship an outstanding team record bringing honor and pride to Newport News Public Schools and to the city of Newport News Virginia in witness thereof we here unto set our hands this 21st day of March 2023. The resolution is signed by each member of the school board and the interim superintendent. Now the championship was a nail biter, but the Wolverines came back from a 16 point deficit to claim the state title. So gentlemen, congratulations on a great season. We're so proud of you. Yeah. Right? Now, tonight's celebration of the team is just the beginning. In coming weeks, there will be other celebratory events to commemorate these talented student athletes. We want to take a moment to acknowledge the families of the state champions present this evening, and we ask that you please stand to be recognized. And family members. <laughs> Now, also joining us this evening is Woodside Principal Dr. Wendy Nichols, Assistant Principal Michael Bellamy and Gracie Foley, Athletic Director Paul Macklin, and other members of the Woodside School family, and our Athletics Director Lee Martin. And we thank you. And we thank you for your presence and support this evening. So we'll take just a few minutes for photos and we'll continue.
and congratulations once again to our student athletes and scholars. Okay, tonight we're recognizing some tremendous teachers. Ensuring that young people are financially literate is paramount to preparing them for future financial success. Our next recognition showcases the school division's success in this area. Working in Support of Education, or WISE, is an educational organization dedicated to building financial literacy, fostering business and social entrepreneurship, and preparing students for college and the global workplace. The organization's literacy certification program provides high school students with financial education and the opportunity to become certified financially literate by successfully passing the WISE Financial Literacy Certification Test. So tonight, we are, we are recognizing seven career and technical education teachers who are named WISE Gold Star Teachers, which means at least 93% of their students in at least one of their classes pass the WISE Financial Literacy Test. And they are present this evening, so I ask that you please join me in congratulating the following teachers. Hope London from Denby High School. <laughs> Stephanie Gwaltney from Minchville High School. <laughs> from Warwick High School, Cherie Ficklin. Kimberly Grant, and Reginald Neely, who was unable to join us. And from Woodside High School, we have Tawanda Allister, and Tina Shorter. Now, the Virginia Standards of Learning for Economics and Personal Finance require instruction in economic concepts, economic reasoning, decision making, and problem solving. High school students have to meet a state requirement to complete a one credit economics and personal finance course prior to graduation. With the help of these dedicated educators, their students have not only satisfied a graduation requirement, they've earned state and national certification. So congratulations to you and to your students for this notable achievement. And let's give them a round of applause. So joining these educators this evening are members of their families, and we ask that they please stand if they are present. And we also want to recognize wonderful. We would also like to recognize members of their school family. Uh, Michelle Hofstetler at Dimbley, the principal. Lisa Egoff at Mitchell High School. Dr. Kelly Mason from Warwick High School and Dr. Wendy Nichols from Woodside High School, and the, and the Division's Career and Technical Education Supervisor, uh, Ms. Jeanette Outland. Would you please stand? We'd like to thank all of you for joining us. So we'll also take a pause at, for the moment to take a picture, but if we can give these fine educators a round of applause one more time. Okay, we have several other principals in the audience, and we ask that you stand as well, please. Thank you. They say it takes a village, it takes a strong team. So thank you very much. We'll pause for a photograph, and we'll continue.
We'd like to take one more moment to congratulate all of tonight's honorees. We will take a short break, and during this time, our viewing audience will be able to enjoy this month's school board spotlight. The school board meeting will stand in recess for seven minutes, so thank you very much. Second graders at Kiln Creek Elementary made black history come alive. During their annual Living Wax Museum, second graders presented a gallery of heroes focusing on the brave, influential, and groundbreaking African Americans who have impacted our world for the better. In the school gymnasium, families were invited to tour the Living Museum. In full costume and in front of colorful and informative posters, students stood as stoic living statues until the black button on their hand was pressed, bringing their presentations to life. Students were responsible for selecting and inspiring African-American, accurately researching their importance, and then writing a speech to teach others about their influential impact. This project pulled together many important learning skills and engaged the students in the educational process by embodying important historical figures. Elected officials went back to school to spend the day learning from the students at Denby High School's Aviation Academy. As part of the Virginia School Board's Association's annual Take Your Legislator to School Day, local representatives spent time with students and school leaders to develop closer relationships between schools, community, and elected officials. Denby was selected as the site this year because legislators have provided special funds to enhance the learning experience at the Aviation Academy. School board, city council, state legislators, and aides representing members of Congress were able to tour the nationally recognized STEM site, which specializes in piloting, aircraft maintenance, and engineering. Students invited elected officials to enjoy an immersive, hands-on experience with state-of-the-art simulators, a fully operational wind tunnel, and flying unmanned aerial vehicles. This time allowed legislators and students the chance to dialogue directly, giving students an insight to the important responsibilities of Virginia General Assembly members. Afterwards, elected officials held an open dialogue with school leaders about the many needs facing Newport News Public Schools, including considering new sources of revenue to modernize and renovate aging buildings, addressing the teacher shortage with stronger teacher development programs, and offering more students effective workforce readiness skills, just like the skilled students at Denby's Aviation Academy. The most important meal of the day is breakfast, and that was certainly the case for fathers and their children at Heinz Middle School. Heinz hosted their first ever father and father figure breakfast, giving dads some extra time with their scholars before a busy day of learning and work. School leaders and educators gladly served families an amazing breakfast spread, while fathers and their children were able to spend quality time catching up on their busy lives. The turnout was impressive, with extra seating needed to pack everyone into the library for the breakfast. After the meal, students headed to class, while fathers stayed for a discussion about the important roles fathers play in the lives of modern middle schoolers Lead custodian David Morgan and eighth grade school counselor Brian Mitnick talked about their own experiences as fathers and shared insights to dealing with the multifaceted issues that parenting presents, such as the dangers of social media, teenagers using smartphones, and the pitfalls of constant access to technology. As the fathers left, they were handed a card that each student personally wrote ahead of time. By hosting a father and father figure breakfast, Heinz is keeping lines of communication open between school and families, while equipping fathers with valuable insights to be the best parent they can for their children. 
Resource teachers at Newsom Park Elementary made reading tangible during Read Across America Week, the nation's largest celebration of reading. Read Across America coincides with the birthday of beloved author Dr. Seuss and takes place in early March, recognized as National Reading Month. At Newsom Park, Read Across America started with not one, but two good books. First and second grade classrooms read Perfect Square to inspire students to start thinking outside the box. While third, fourth, and fifth graders were inspired to create with recycled materials after reading one plastic bag. Guest readers, including elected school board members, bilingual educators, and community partners, spent time reading these books and some of their personal favorites throughout the week. Reading specialist and current NNPS Elementary Teacher of the Year, Barbara Brinker, collaborated with resource teachers who created fun activities to enhance the educational experience after reading Perfect Square and One Plastic Bag. Each activity revolved around the theme, the art of STEM, since Newsom Park is the math, science, and technology magnet school. In the library, students moved beyond a perfect square and solved puzzles using the seven polygon shapes found in tangrams. Physical education and music combined their efforts so students could learn a traditional square dance called the Virginia Reel. In art, younger grades deconstructed a square to create new works of art, while older grades used the themes in one plastic bag to create friendship bracelets out of plastic bags. And during their instructional STEM resource time, students were welcome to engineer something fun and usable using either a perfectly square piece of paper or plastic bags. At Newsom Park, reading was the springboard for creating, learning, and building as students read across America. I hope you enjoyed this month's School Board Spotlight. Uh, during our regular meetings, we provide time for the public to address the School Board. These opportunities are scheduled in the early part of our agenda and also towards the end of the meeting. As advertised, citizens may submit comments via email up to 30 minutes prior to our meeting time to be included in the official meeting record. 
For those of you joining us in person, the board considers this an opportunity to listen to your comments. Please understand that we will consider your concerns. We ask that you comply with our three minute time limit. As you begin your comments, a green light will come on, a yellow light signals you have 30 seconds remaining, and a red light and beep indicate your time is up. As your name is called, please do come forward. Shana Murphy. Hello. When does my time start? Oh, okay. I'm ready. Okay. Good evening. For the three minutes that I have your attention, I hope to bring awareness to the school board regarding the current dress code based in our city of Newport News. According to the current dress code on page 6, line 10, the dress code states garments that are excessively tight, clothing that resembles leggings, jeggings, tights, or yoga pants unless worn underneath a sh shirt, shorts, Dress or skirt that is at least mid-thigh length are not allowed. This means that kindergartners through 12th grade are not allowed to wear leggings or pants without wearing a shirt that comes to mid-thigh. In other terms, that covers below their bottom. Unfortunately, children, especially in middle school, ages 11 through 14, are being visually inspected daily at the entrance of their schools before the school day begins and reprimanded for wearing age-appropriate clothing. Unfortunately, children in the age group of 11 through 14 are being sent to the office to call parents to request new clothing be brought to the school before they can even start their education. For example, one occasion, a student was dress coded for wearing jeans that had a fingernail length fray on their jeans, not a hole. They were forced to put blue, bright blue painter's tape over the holes of their jeans and walk around school like that until a parent could bring them different clothing. Another example, a student was dress coded for wearing black leggings with an adult small unisex t-shirt that came past her bottom. This student wears a size 10, 12 in children's. So the student also sat in the office from that time they left the bus until their parents showed up at 9.55. This student missed out on two full classes, losing out on a morning's worth of education. In the city of Newport News, the mission has been creating college career and citizen ready students. But how are we creating college career and citizen ready students when they are forced to miss out on an education due to clothes? Girls, girls in particular are being dress coded for age appropriate clothing and requested to wear oversized clothing to cover themselves to not cause a distraction. The dress code implies that persons wearing age appropriate size clothing are considered inappropriate and distracting. When checking in with my child, she is humiliated, embarrassed, and feels isolated each morning when walking into her school. The isolation comes from the inconsistency in staff members choosing who to code for the day. The embarrassment has led my child to withdraw from school programs such as cheer and other activities being offered within the school setting. There are in fact several students who dress all the same, yet one out of five students following the dress code will be coded. The statistic is not a challenge to dress code everyone, however, to address the isolation on female students. Newport News is isolating our students and shaming them for dressing in leggings. The actions of being visually inspected over clothing is creating emotional damage to children who already have to worry about their safety when coming to school. Schools are creating a guilt and shame complex to be forced into the minds of children who are already at a vulnerable mindset. As parents, we want our children to feel safe and accepted by peers and adults alike. We as pa We as parents want our children to gain an education, which is why we send them to school in the first place. The safety in our students stretch beyond the physical. It includes the mental and emotional safety as well. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The next person that we have is Brian Murphy. Brian? Good evening. Good evening. Oh, okay, I'm ready. Uh, good evening. I'm here this uh, evening representing my daughter, Arletta Murphy. And we'd like to discuss the dress code and the impacts it has on my daughter thus far this year. This year, my daughter made a big transition from elementary school going into middle school. As we all know, this is a big moment in life, and there are a lot of emotions and hesitations making this transition. Within her first week at the school, she was pulled to the side to be told that her jeans were inappropriate and violated the dress code. And to add insult to injury, she had to put bright blue painter's tape um, applied to the openings of her jeans, and she had to walk throughout the school and sit in class along her peers with the embarrassing tape applied to her pants until other pants could be brought to her. 
This was extremely embarrassing and made the already difficult transition to the new school she was already facing that more difficult. From that day, every morning she has had anxiety and second guesses anything that she picks out to wear to the school in fear that she will be dress coded and humiliated again. On another occasion, just a few weeks ago, my daughter was pulled aside after getting off the bus and dress coded again for wearing inappropriate clothing. She had on black leggings and a woman's shirt, which was oversized, covering her backside. She was sent to the office in which her mother had to take time from work to come and pick her up, causing my daughter to miss educational time, which should be the number one concern to the school. Later that day, it was determined that in fact she was not in violation of the dress code, as her oversized shirt did cover her backside while wearing leggings, which is, part, which is in line with the Newport News Public School Rights and Responsibilities Handbook. I took some time to review the 2022-23 Newport News Public School Rights and Responsibility Handbook, and on page six, the student code section, bullet 10, states, garments that are excessively tight, clothing that resembles leggings, jeggings, tights, or yoga pants, and less warm underneath a shirt, dress, or skirt that is mid-thigh length. This is an unreasonable rule that is body shaming and isolating the young girls that attend school, making them alter the way they are dressing so that they are not considered a distraction per the dress code, which is also altering their impressionable young minds on what is actually appropriate. I, I leave you today with thoughts of a father that is raising a daughter to feel comfortable and empowered as a young woman. These rules do not empower the young girls that attend the school to embrace themselves and feel comfortable in their own bodies, thus leaving them confused and anxious. Schools should be, invi school should be an inviting environment made to make everyone feel safe and comfortable, and these rules are not portraying that type of environment. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Amanda Bartley. Amanda Bartley. Hello, my name is Amanda Bartley. I am a parent of a student at Heidenwood and a student at Gildersleeve. And I 100% agree with the two of you. Um, but I'm actually here to talk about the um, calendar for next year. Uh, as you may know, as I have said and other people have said, there is a uh, eclipse coming up next year. And it happens right on that first day that the teachers come back to school on the 8th of April. And the best place to view it is not here in Newport News. It is like Ohio Valley area. And there are people, the parents may want to take their children to go see it. I know my husband and I would like to take our children to go see it. And that means I have to be back because I'm a teacher. I have to be back on the 8th and completely miss it or take personal time, which then obviously affects our pay. So I'm hoping that you'll consider adding one more day to spring break, whether it's another planning day or moving the planning day to Tuesday, along with that extra day. I am very grateful for the fact that uh, the peninsula has the same uh, spring break. It's very handy for parents who work in one district and have kids in another. We really appreciate that. And as a parent, I would like to say thank you for putting the planning days on the calendar already for next year instead of springing them in the middle of the year because that affected a lot of parents having to try and find childcare, daycare. Luckily, my children have their grandparents living with us, so I didn't have to worry about childcare for the times that I have to go to work and they didn't have school. So I'd like to uh, uh, thank you for that part. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michael Bartley. Move that up. Hello. And uh, when I uh, address this, uh, this body, I always try and remind you what we do is try and educate children, and everything we should be doing is should be focused on that, and things that aren't that should be aiding that. And I will echo my wife that you should extend the, uh, the spring break next year by one day so that we can go see the eclipse uh, up in Ohio. So I do have um, some visual aids here. So this right here this is $18. So I asked my kids, what would you do with $18? One of the answers was fidget spinners is about what I expected. The other one said, I buy seeds. It's like, cool, that's, that's interesting. 
One of the things you could do with $18 is you could send a kid to the Virginia Living Museum if you're not a member like we are. Um, but if you take the amount of money that we gave the, the superintendent divided by this class, that's 18 bucks. So you could have sent all of the kids to the Virginia Living Museum on a field trip for that money. So this, this is a uh, $280. This is what uh, you could have for a classroom. Um, I don't think any teachers would say, you know, we should spend this money by giving it to a superintendent who wasn't supporting us. I just don't think that's a good use of money. But I was looking at our budget, and you see 109% um, increase for the superintendent. Kind of went over where that went. And then the security officers, 109% increase. Well, I kind of know why that happened. But you have a total of 6.7% uh, um, increase in funding. And inflation is 6 so really anything un less than 6% is a pay cut. If you look at teachers, it's 4.5%. That's really a 1.5% cut for teachers that you're spending. And uh, if you look at education in America since the 70s, we've doubled the per pupil spending. And teachers' pay has only gone up 20% because administrators get more. If you look at principals, they get 12.9. Assistant principals, 17.1. And we had a assistant principal that didn't even know how to dial 911 when it has a kid has a gun. Maybe we just educate on that and don't have such a big increase. Instructional aides, that's minus 6.7%. We really need to concentrate on educating the children. We don't need the administrators of 9.5%. I mean, that's what we're, that's our priorities. And that's what we're voting on with the, the budget is what our priorities are. And the budget that is presented shows that the priorities are not instruction to the students. It's to the administrators. And the administrators do not teach kids. The teachers and the instructional assistants teach kids. And I know that we have a, a big problem with not enough uh, school bus drivers, and they're also not very well represented in this either. So I would ask you to re reconsider this budget. Thank you. Thank you. Our last card for the evening, I believe, is Jennifer Wilkes. Good evening. I'm here today on behalf of my daughter, Hannah Wilkes, and many other students in Gildersleeve Middle School. I would like to address one part of the dress code that many feel is of particular concern. Garments that are excessively tight, clothing that resembles leggings, jeggings, tights, or yoga pants unless worn underneath a shirt, shorts, shirt, <coughs> shorts, dress, or skirt that is mid-thigh length are not allowed in school. This rule, rule gives little room for girls to wear anything to school that is deemed appropriate. This is what we're asking our children to wear. If you go to any store with children's clothing, the two available choices for pants are typically jeans or leggings. I'm a strict mother who does not allow her child to wear many of the trends we see today. However, I cannot support a rule that is such an undue burden to both parents and students. My daughter is a size 10 in children's, yet we have to go shirt shopping for school and size up to juniors medium or large just to cover her front and rear end. What we're asking is unreasonable. When we go larger, the necklines are too wide and the shoulders slide down, exposing bra straps, which is also a dress code violation, or shirts that look like a nightgown. I cannot even express the anxiety that my child has in the morning trying to get ready for school, nor the headache of the many shopping trips we have had to try to find clothes that follow the dress code. Just two weeks ago, we went to seven different stores to look for shirts that would cover her front and rear end in leggings after a growth spurt, but that wasn't enough for her to be deemed appropriate when she entered school last week. My student has straight A's, is in the gifted program, does not date, is on the cheer squad, and treats students and staff with respect, was forced to miss her STEM presentation. She is a student you would never find in the office for misbehaving, and it saddens me that the importance of her education was postponed simply because she wore leggings for PE. For reference, the middle school was not providing PE uniforms nor allowing students to dress out at the time. After calling the problem out with the principal, students are now allowed five whole minutes to change for PE. To add insult to injury, another student wearing a much shorter shirt and leggings came into the Gildersleeve office after I met with Mr. Noel. After pointing out the dress code violation to staff, they said they were not allowed to dress code students and the one staff member in the office that was allowed walked back to his office without saying a word. The rules regarding leggings are not evenly applied within Gildersleeve nor throughout the entirety of the Newport News school system. My youngest child is a second grader at BC Charles and has never had a problem wearing leggings with normal sized shirts to school. 
In addition, I cannot fathom an elementary school disbanding leggings. Most children I know hate the feeling of jeans and refuse to wear them. I also have a dear friend whose child attends the magnet program at Booker T. Washington Middle School. Within that program, students are required to wear uniforms. The khakis that she wears regularly are in fact leggings. And she wears normal, appropriate size polo shirts that fall at the hip line. She does not wear oversized or men's polos that would reach mid thigh, yet she has never been dress coded. As it reads in the student code of conduct, the Newport News dress code was designed to promote safety. Is that time? It is. Okay. I'll email the rest. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Do we have any other cards? Any other cards this evening? No? Okay. So thank you for your comments this evening. We do appreciate you coming down and sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, and we will look for additional supporting information, as you, as you mentioned. Um, so we will now move on to Section 3, the Consent Agenda, which includes 3.01 minutes from the work session on February 21st, 2023, 3.02 minutes from the regular session on February 21, 2023, 3.03 minutes from the special meeting on February 9, 2023, 3.04 financial reports, including the revenue report, for February 2023, the expense report for February 2023, child nutrition reports for, for February 2023, uh, 3.05, the personnel report, 3.06, the budget transfer, and 3.07, e an easement um, for CNI IV Avenue Road reconstruction project. At this time, can we have a motion to approve the consent agenda. Madam Chair, I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, thank you. Any discussion? Madam Chair, in regards to item 207, the business plan and report, um, I'd like to make a couple of additional points. Um, to my staff, I'd like to review the items you're talking about. Okay, sounds good. Um, let's see, who do we have that can speak to? The easement for the CNI. Here he comes. Hi, Mr. Fairheart. Good evening. Good evening. I'm trying to pull it up. Okay, thank you. Just to refresh my memory. Pardon the delay. No worries. Yes. Can you scroll down a little bit, Deb? And if you can keep going down. And there's more detail. And there's a diagram, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. There it is. Yes. So this is. Um, He's on page 12. Tubal Durham Academy Elementary. So there's an easement that runs parallel to the field. Um, they've asked the, the city has requested for a utility fixture to be put on, as I face the screen, the right, the right front of the fenced area. Um, you can see by the language in the um, request, I think it's, uh, I'm not sure it's an option. Um, but what we've asked, uh, actually, let me step back a second. Mr. Beverly and I went out there. Um, it's actually in the middle of the fence line as we speak now. Um, we've requested it to go back either to the front or to the back, um, but we think there are some parameters around which they have to run power to power. Um, so we're waiting on their um, decision there. But other than that, um, we feel it's an appropriate request and that it's not going to, um, you know, sacrifice anything that we're able to offer our students. Okay. Mr. Brown, did you have further questions? giving up land um, or is it simply an easement so that they can connect power lines it's an easement so they can connect power lines okay um, madam chair let me if you go to page 13 of this there's a google earth that i think makes it a little clear sorry mm -hmm. it is up to this number. further down um so there and then if you zoom out you can kind of see it's on the bottom this way yeah. yeah see it's like this little square block just thing. a square block we we've asked that on that side of ivy avenue it either 
we think it could potentially move down to my left, lower left, and not be in the center of the field. Mm -hmm. We've also asked if there's potential for it to move to the upper right, just so it not be in the middle of our parcel. Um, that would be best to us. Um, okay. But again, at the request of the city. Okay. And then just uh, other question, just in regards to, I realize it's a field now, but one day it could be a playground or could be a soccer field or, or, or something else uh, that we play sports on. Um, does this easement impact any of our abilities to have activities on that field? I think Mr. Martin has identified the fact that we're able to still develop that as necessary. I think that's our plan moving forward, actually. So I think we have soccer goals there now. Yeah. So basically what they're putting in is a stub up, basically. Correct. They cover it up. Just fence. Like, yeah. It's going to be fenced. Stub the up. fence will match what's the, the fencing along Ivy Avenue now. I guess, I guess the question should have been, you know, <laughs> Uh, in the future, can we tap off of it if we had to? <laughs> if anything, that's what we should be asking. <laughs> well, it's there. Maybe we can. Well, I would think so. Have to be in writing, but yeah. Okay. Well, we appreciate you keeping us updated on its development too. After after you have discussions. All right. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Um, additional questions on the consent agenda. Any others? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Harris. Four. Hunter. Four. Alger. Four. Amon. Four. Best. Four. Brown. Four. Sorrell's Law. Four. Motion carries seven zero. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is section four. We have some action items. Uh, this evening, 4.01. 2023 to 2024, the proposed school calendar. Dr. Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Chair. As you stated this evening, we have two action items that will come before you. To begin with, uh, Tracy Brooks, special assistant to the superintendent, will share some feedback provided regarding the proposed 2023-24 calendar. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chairman, Madam Vice Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Mitchell. The School Division's Calendar Committee prepared a draft calendar that we presented to you at your February meeting. This evening, I will briefly share some of the feedback that we received from the community through our webpage, meetings with advisory groups, and others as you consider action on the proposal. But first, I'd like to share some general information on a couple of instructional priorities that shape the calendar draft being proposed for next year. Two of the instructional priorities in the forefront of the calendar committee's work was first to maximize the time for students to receive high quality instruction and second to increase much needed planning time for teachers and as you may recall we came back to you twice in as many years to request additional teacher planning time after the school year had started so we're trying to get ahead of that for next school year. Now, in terms of maximizing instructional time for students, the committee worked to allow schools more time to address loss in student learning from the summer, increase the instructional time for students preparing for high stakes tests, such as advanced placement and international baccalaureate program exams that are administered in the spring, and to allow the school division to move the SOL testing window later to provide more instructional time before the tests are administered and more opportunities to retake take the test if needed. Now to increase planning time for teachers, the calendar draft provides an appropriate amount of time for teachers to plan instruction throughout the year. It allows time for teachers to strategically plan for differentiated instruction to meet students' learning needs. And lastly, the draft includes much needed teacher planning time, as we mentioned before, to reduce the need to return to the school board to request additional calendar changes in the fall. Now we posted the draft calendar on the website for feedback and we received numerous comments in favor of the draft as well as some concerns or suggestions and four major themes emerge. First was to maintain the current Monday through Friday winter break. Second was to shorten the winter break so that we may end the school year sooner. 
Third, to reduce the number of in-service days for teachers in August. And fourth, to end the school year a week earlier on June 7th instead of June 12th, since we're starting school before Labor Day and by using instructional hours and dates instead of days to meet the state requirements. So in speaking to the first two comments, which were to maintain the two-week winter break or to shorten the winter break to end the school year sooner, there were many comments to shorten the winter break, but for next school year, most who provided feedback favored maintaining the two-week winter break Monday through Friday and closing out the school year on June 12th as designated on the calendar. Next was a suggestion proposed by some teachers to reduce the number of in-service days in August. Now, while this is much needed time to prepare for the start of school, there are actually two fewer in-service days in the calendar for next year than there were in this current year. And the in-service days also help teachers to meet their 192-day annual contracts. And the last suggestion was to end the school year on June 7th instead of June 12th, since we're starting before Labor Day, and to use instructional hours to end the year sooner. Now, while the draft calendar consists of 176 student days, but exceeds 990 instructional hours required by the state, there are specific hours per level that we are required to meet as indicated on this slide, and just slightly past 140 hours per credit bearing course at the high school level in next year's calendar. So we always maintain and monitor those hours. And as I stated earlier, we want to ensure that we maximize the instructional time for our students. And our proposed June 12th last day of school is consistent with most of the end dates for our neighboring school divisions on the peninsula. So in closing, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to share some of the feedback we received, and I'll be happy to answer your questions, any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Our questions? Well, Madam Chair, I'll make uh, Go ahead. one uh, question and comment. Uh, so I th thank the committee. I do see that November 7th, Election Day, is a day that students won't have to report. Uh, but my question is, uh, in regards to future years, can we work towards making Election Day a holiday for our schools. Yes, we, we and we talked about that in the committee as well, and we are going to put that in the future. The teachers did appreciate the fact that typically on that day, it's an e-commute day for them, and they appreciated that flexibility, and they suggested that we do share that with the calendar committee next year in planning for the, the future calendar. So thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. We do appreciate all of your time and attention and organization and coming and letting us know what the responses have been once we um, put it out for public uh, viewing. So thank you for that. Thank you. All right, do I have a uh, motion um, to adopt our FY24 proposed calendar? Uh, Madam Chair, I move to approve the 2023-2024 proposed school calendar as presented. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. And I believe we had our questions, but I'll ask again. Do we have any questions? I just want to offer one comment sort of towards next year as for the plan calendar planning committee. I, too, have received feedback on the, you know, earlier rather than later end of the year since we're starting earlier so I would ask as we go forward with this next year um, those involved you know consider we've got the extra days and they're planning and that's good say after winter break spring break um, if there are any preferable arrangements that might enable students to be done a little bit sooner I think you can lose some student engagement the later into June you go uh, particularly with high school graduation being a week and a half before the school year even ends. So I would encourage us to seriously look at what's working next year and what we might be able to tweak to achieve that. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? <clears throat> I'll just make one other comment. This is re in regards to how the calendar then rolls into summer school. And so given that we are starting school sooner and we're contemplating ending sooner, we need to consider how we can impact and move summer school up because um, oftentimes for families, having a lot of time between 
the end of the school year and the start of summer school, and then so summer school being very short, and then a l bunch of time at the tail end, summer school suddenly becomes, one, less effective for the kids that it was intended for, but then two, disruptive in terms of uh, families that are planning trips and things. So we, we couldn't do the trip anyways, but we still have this shortened time that the, the, the child's in summer school. So I uh, would like us to consider really, if we're gonna, ha you know, having, we're having summer school committing to that and really extending that time to make it effective and, and having either the time on the front end or the back end of the summer uh, for vacation time. Okay, any further comments? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Harris. Four. 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 Amen. Four. Best. Four. Brown. Four. Searles Law. Four. Motion carries seven zero. Thank you. The next item is agenda 4.02, the FY24 proposed operating budget. Dr. Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Chair. At this time, Scarlett Minto, our Chief Financial Officer, will provide a summary of the proposed FY 2024 proposed budget. Thank you, Ms. Minto. Good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Co-Chair, members of the Board, and Dr. Mitchell. Tonight, we bring to you the Superintendent's proposed fiscal year 2024 operating budget for board consideration. This spending plan will support the goals and vision set by the school district strategic plan journey 2025 and the priorities we have identified during this budget cycle. A uh, budget plan like this could not be pulled together without the support um, and everyone pulling together to make a difference for our students. And I would just like to give a shout out to all the school board members, Dr. Mitchell, Mayor Jones, Vice Mayor Bethany, City Council members, the City Manager, City Budget Staff, my Budget Staff, and Human Resources. And there's many others, but like you say, it takes a village. But I just want to make sure I say thank you to everyone. Thank you. Um, for the Superintendent's proposed fiscal year 2024 budget, we are projecting a total revenue of $381.4 million. The state revenue increase of $20.5 million is based on the governor's proposal, and of course we're waiting for him to approve a budget, so we'll have to bring you an updated number in the future. I am pleased to report the city will be fully funding our fiscal year operating budget request of $3.4 million, and then we have $100,000 in other revenue for a total of Increase of revenue of 24 million. For fiscal year 2024, our compensation strategy, this budget plan will fund a 5% increase for support staff. We'll reduce our salary compression for the remaining steps one through five. So we will now have steps one through 30 with no compression. Teacher salary increases will range from seven to 10.4%. And I wanna be clear, the minimum teacher increase is 7%. Uh, increase starting teacher pay to 52,710 and provide some experience adjustments as funding allows. Um, this budget plan will support additional staffing requests and include safety officers, licensed clinical social workers, and attendant specialist positions, which are fully supported by the city increase in funding for a total of 50 e, 51 FTEs. And finally, to summarize, the chart on the right summarizes the increases and decreases to balance the fiscal year 2024 budget. So we have an increase of 20.6 million for salaries. The FTE request will total 1.8 million. Our health fund uh, school board premium increase is 2.4 million. New Horizons tuition increase will be 300,000. Fuel and utilities increase will be 1 million. Operations and maintenance increase will be 1.9 million. 1.6 million in one-to-one -one technology or middle school laptops will be 1.1 million for a total increase of 30.7 million. Air decreases will be 1.8 million for staff turnover savings, 3.5 for staff attrition, 1.1 and one-time contracts that are not going to be renewed in FY23, uh, $400,000 in employee uh, care premium increase to offset the 2.4 in total increase for our health plan cost for a total decrease of 6.8 million. We have projected 24 million in new revenue and we have uh, 24 million here. So this is presents a balanced budget for fiscal year 2024. In addition to the operating fund request to the city, the city will fully fund um, building safety needs with cash capital funding and cover our playground equipment from their operating. 
Lastly, we will make middle school sports in Todd Stadium priorities as we reconcile our unspent expenditures and work with the city for reversion <laughs> funding for fiscal year 2024. At this time, we will need the school board to consider for approval the following funding amounts for 2024. Our general fund, which is also called the operating budget, uh, $381,396,025. Our textbook fund, $2,640,273. Workers comp fund, $2,328,486. And our child nutrition services fund, $22,995,450. For a total, all school board funds to be adopted of 409,360,234. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we have any questions? Okay, Dr. Best? I have a question. Could you, in layman's terms, for the public, explain maybe in a couple of sentences why compression is good? Or bad. Or, mm -hmm. right. or bad. <laughs> right. I meant that, but that's what I meant. Mm -hmm. why so we, we want to why recognize we want to our, yes. Mm -hmm. We want to recognize our staff for their um, years of experience, whether they're teachers or support staff. And so we have came up with a percentage between grades or between steps on a teacher scale to make sure that they're getting. You don't want a person that has ten years of experience to get the same pay as somebody who has thirty years of experience. So this is what we call compression when they're too close. So we work to make sure we can keep those separated and so people are um, recognized for their uh, experience and years of teaching experience. Thank you. All right, and uh, Mr. Brown. All right, and so if we can go back, um, I think one slide, I just wanna confirm this because when we had our mm -hmm. March the 7th uh, presentation, the uh, $2.4 million was identified for middle school sports was unfunded at that time mm -hmm. and it included um, sports field for Fitzgerald, sports field for Crittenden, sports field for Achievable Dream, sports uh, practice field for Passage, practice field for Gildersleeve, practice field for Booker T. Washington, mm -hmm. football equipment, uh, and outdoor scoreboards and, and then as, as well the uh, artificial turf at Todd Stadium. Correct. If we pass this budget tonight, uh, we will be able to fund those items? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Exciting. Mr. Harris, did you have a question? Uh, just a statement. Okay, go uh, right ahead. Yeah, sure. I want to thank you for all the hard work you and your staff have put in and producing this budget. Thank you. And I think the average citizens don't realize that we do not create our own money, that our, our finances come from three locations, you know, state, federal, and uh, local, and that over the last couple of years, we re re really worked hard on developing a positive relationship That's with right. the city. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we are headed in that right direction. Um, you know, I hear it, I see it, and so I really appreciate all the hard work and, and, and dedication that you guys have put into it. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Other comments or questions? Madam well, Chair, I'll make one other comment. That, sure. And uh, I, I know I've um, sweated this very hard, uh, especially with the middle school sports uh, portion, <laughs> and I want to uh, thank um, the uh, budget committee uh, that you've um, led and as well uh, our partners in city council for uh, helping us uh, realize a longstanding vision that has been out there, a need that is uh, significant in our community, as well that um, tonight, we, if we pass this budget, we're gonna be able to do, I think, the largest pay raise that I think we've ever done for our staff. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot to be excited and be uh, excited about and be proud of in this budget. So I'm looking forward to you calling the roll. All right. Do I have a motion? Um, to approve our FY24 proposed operating budget. So yes. moved. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do I have a second? Second. <laughs> no more conversation. <laughs> Please call the roll. <laughs> uh, she needs to read the motion. Oh, that's okay. right. We do. We need to read the amount. Go right ahead, Dr. Beth. And Madam Chair, I move to approve the proposed FY24 operating budget in the amount of $409,360,234. Great. Thank you so much. Now we will call the roll. Harris? Four. Hunter? Four. Alger? Four. Amon? Four. Best? Four. Brown? Four. Searles Law? 
four. Motion carries seven zero. Great. And now I will make my comments about the budget. I I love that um, Miss Mentos got up Miss Mentos got up here and thanked everybody, but we really need to thank her. Um, <laughs> working with you on this budget. I am thrilled by the way it meets our needs. Um, it is aligned with our strategic plan. It, um, it addresses our immediate needs as well. And I cannot, I am be greatly remiss if I did not mention the work that has been done by our uh, mayor, our newly elected mayor, and our city council. Yes, it does have to go in front of them. Uh, for their vote, but we have worked with them um, on this project, uh, and um, I think the thing that brought brought it to fruition for us is that they realized that we are part of the city, and they said that by passing this type of a budget, um, that that demonstrates that. And so I'm just extremely appreciative of it. And we will be, as we always are, good stewards with the money that we receive. And we're looking to do great things for our students in the division. So that being said, we'll move on to section five, reports and information. We have 5.01, our monthly school update, Dr. Mitchell. Thank you again, Madam Chair. I feel like I'm thanking you a lot tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight we are sharing some exciting news from our teaching and learning department as part of our monthly school report. Present this evening are three members of the team. Megan Amon, our coordinator who is assisting us with the extended learning program, will begin the presentation with a focus on summer school plans, followed by Tammy Byron, our STEM instructional supervisor, with an update on STEM activities and opportunities while Katie Sheehan Smith, our visual and performing arts supervisor, will round out the presentation with information regarding the arts program. Ms. Almond. Good evening, Chairman Searles Law, Vice Chair Dr. Best, and Dr. Mitchell. My name is Megan Almond, and I am here representing the Spark team this evening. I would like to provide you an update concerning Summer School 2023. This summer, our SPARK program will offer students opportunities to receive remediation, enrichment, credit recovery, and credit advancement. The focus at our six elementary school locations will be remediation in English and math, while providing enrichment opportunities in the area of science. The focus in middle school will address remediation in English and math, while providing enrichment experiences in the area of computer science. Students who are currently in grades eight through 12 may take credit bearing recovery courses or credit advancement. Later in the presentation, Tammy Byron will provide an update on the enrichment camps that will be offered to Newport News students. This slide highlights our site locations at each level. Our six elementary locations were chosen to ensure students across the city had nearby sites. Discovery STEM Academy and Carver Elementary will serve as our downtown sites. Hydenwood Elementary and Sanford Elementary will serve as our Midtown sites. And McIntosh Elementary and Greenwood Elementary will serve as our Uptown sites. Gildersleeve will serve as a site for middle school this year, and it was chosen due to the Midtown location. High School Summer School will be at Woodside to include Outdoor Ed, which will utilize Newport News Park. Transportation and meals will be provided for all summer programs. Elementary and Middle School Spark will be held Monday through Thursday, June 26th through July 27th for a total of 18 days. This is an extension from last year of three days. High School will operate on two 10-day sessions running Monday through Thursday from June 21st to July 27th. In observance of the national holiday, students will not report to Spark on Monday, July 3rd or Tuesday, July 4th. Summer school will conclude for all levels on July 27th. This summer, our elementary and middle school programs will run for a total of five hours each day. We will run a two-tiered system with our first group of elementary locations operating from 8.15 a.m. to 1.15 p.m. 
Discovery STEM Academy and our middle school location, Gildersleeve, will operate from 9.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. At the high school level, Advancement Courses and the Summer Institute for the Arts will operate from 7.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. for a total of seven hours. This year, high school sessions were reduced by a total of three days. As a result, we have increased the time for Advancement and the Summer Institute for the Arts by 30 minutes daily to allow extra time for content to be covered. Course recovery and work keys will operate from 7.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. each day for a total of three and a half hours. This slide addresses the identification of students who will attend Spark Summer School. Students who require remediation in the areas of reading and or math will be enrolled in Spark at the elementary and middle school levels. Families will be asked to complete the registration form that will go home with the quarter three report card. This will be used to secure student summer school location and determine bus stop information. For our elementary and middle school students, criteria has been determined by the Curriculum Development Department and the information will go out this Thursday in the principal's packet so that all schools have this information. Families will be notified on the quarter three report card if their child will be enrolled in SPARC. Current high school students in grades eight through 12 will have the opportunity to retake courses for credit recovery or to take a new course for credit advancement during the summer SPARC program. Any student who would benefit from credit recovery will receive a registration form via mail from the professional school counselor. Families who are interested in credit advancement opportunities should work with their child's professional school counselor to receive approval and register for the correct course. We are pleased to share that our staff application was sent through an email blast to all staff members on March 3rd. As of today, we have received over 500 applications for summer employment and there is still time for employees to apply. Another email blast was sent to all staff members today with the application link. Any interested individuals can reference the summer school emails or visit our website. We will begin to send out employee employment notifications this Friday, March 24th. After this date, we will operate on a rolling hire. This concludes my portion of the presentation and the team is here to answer any questions. I know we have some questions. Let me start down on this end if I have anyone. Do you don't have any right now? Okay, I'll go to this end. Dr. Best? Um, I, the some high school will be held at Woodside. Yes. And I heard you say something related to Newport News Park. Can you just elaborate just a little bit? I know it was at Woodside last Correct. year as well because my daughter attended. Correct. There. Yes, mm -hmm. it was at Woodside, and of course, mm -hmm. transportation will be provided to Woodside. However, we have the outdoor ed program that will utilize Woodside and also Newport News, a park that is right there. For, so for the outside ed program. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Could you tell me maybe a little bit about that? Just maybe a couple of sentences. Yes, <laughs> um, so outdoor ed is one of the health and PE options that are that are offered through the summer um, and they take advantage of Newport News Park canoeing fishing hiking um, it's more of a hands-on skill based experience rather than um, a, a typical PE that you would do in a gym so it's one of the summer options that Newport News has done quite consistently and then just pairs nicely with um, Woodside being right there because they use the white activity buses to transport those students. So they'll come on our yellow school buses to Woodside, board the white buses to go over to Newport News Park, spend their day, and then return to Woodside to catch their main transportation home. Okay. And in the past, it has opened, freed up a spot on their schedule during the year because then they don't have to take physical right. education mm -hmm. okay. and it allows them to pick up some additional courses. I was just wondering, is that a problem for students that live in the south portion of the city to travel or to be able to get to get to. there the distance if you miss the bus I know they had it there last year so I'm just mm -hmm. wondering about that it has not been in the past and the few instances where we've had students to miss the bus Mr. Coates has sent a, a bus back yeah. to pick them up okay. and then I have one more question go ahead so you said elementary students will be selected based on their proficiency levels in reading or math do you have any projections for how many and is that mandatory? So that's what we're finalizing right now. The criteria that will go out to our schools, um, we're going to be considering any student who falls under that criteria to be enrolled into SPARC. Okay. Uh, Faldra? Yes. 
Yes, um, so I'm not sure if this is a question for you, but students who are in the ELL program, where did, are they part of SPARC? as well as students with special needs. Correct. Absolutely, yep. We okay. will have programs for both, and specifically we actually have a newcomer program as well, and those students will also be serviced this summer. Okay, great. Um, yes. Mr. Harris? I see you highlighted over 500 applicants. Is that normal? More From normal? what I've been told, absolutely not. We were really excited about this number, and that was before the email push went out today, so I'm excited to go in and open up and see how many we have as of today this afternoon. Great. Yep. Great. Mr. Brown? <clears throat> My question is similar to Dr. Best, and I, I do want to know, you know, by level, um, how many students? Um, and so if we don't know that now, I'd still like to get that answer as soon as, mm -hmm. okay. as soon as we can, the number of students that we are projecting. And then the criteria that we're um, using to select students uh, uh, for the program. So for the high school, so I, I understand, um, for elementary school, it'll be based upon their essentially their SOL proficiency, but for high school, it says um, the the counselors. What criteria are the counselors using to select students for a high school? Okay, and I can get that information to you as well. And typically, for the students in high school who have not passed the course, mm -hmm. they are extended an invitation. Okay. Yes, correct, and that's what I referenced. The professional school counselors will be mailing mm -hmm. a application to all of them based on semester grades. Semester grades. And then the the last question is just in terms of uh, prior to the pandemic, we were at a level of, of attempting to increase the number of classes that we offer during summer school, particularly for our high school students, uh, particularly math um, courses uh, in high school in the summer. Where do we stand now with essentially getting back to pre-pandemic levels, and then? What classes are we looking at adding additional to summer school to our catalog of courses? And that is where we're at right now in our planning. We're having those conversations about specific courses that will be provided this summer. And so as soon as we finalize those, we can get you that information as well. And part of what they will do is look at the courses that are needed based on those students who didn't pass the class. Okay. And then also based on the um, request from parents for, for the um, accelerated courses. Yes, Ms. Heyman. Um, thank you. Um, you mentioned that the elementary students that are, you know, under a certain benchmark would be automatically enrolled. What is the envision process for ensuring parents are contacted? We we confirm it so we don't send buses out every which way. Correct. Yeah, and that's why we actually have that registration form. So that will go home to ensure that we know the site location that the student will be placed at, as well as bus stop information. And then the families will be notified with the information of where their child will be, a postcard inviting them to start their first day at Spark and which site they'll be at. So they'll get that information. And you said that they would be automatically enrolled. So is that going to be a, we really need your child to do this to be ready for fourth grade or? Yes, yeah, so this year we're really focusing on that criteria of students who would need the remediation. And so that will be marked on their report card at the elementary level, as well as the application will go home with it, or the registration form. Okay. Once again, I like being last because all of my questions were, were asked. Um, I am going to say I'm excited about the additional three days um, and the addition of time that the students will have with instruction. Um, you know, it was many years ago that my daughter went through um, the SIA, but, you know, the more contact, the better, and the better opportunity for those students to just have an enriching summer. So I'm glad that we're doing that. I was going to ask about increasing um, teacher participation until I saw our the current number because I remember last year we had actually considered um, offering the opportunity from teachers coming from other districts and divisions to come and support us through the summer but it sounds like we can take care of our own we're very encouraged with our numbers. okay yes, we're excited well thank you for this preliminary report we'll look forward to updates as well Wonderful. At this time, Tammy Byron will share a STEM report. Great. Thank you, Megan. Good evening, Madam Chair Solis Law, Vice Chair Dr. Best, and Dr. Mitchell. Before I begin this evening, I'd like to take a moment to introduce two extraordinary STEM specialists who have been instrumental in the work that I'll be sharing. Jennifer Barker and Kevin L. Hubel work at the division level to actualize STEM initiatives by working in our schools. J. 
Jennifer Barker supports pre-K and elementary, while Kevin focuses on our secondary programs, along with supporting our competitive robotics teams. Jennifer and Kevin, could you please stand so the board can put faces to the names behind our STEM success? We thank you for your dedication and passion. Thank you. In this evening's brief STEM report, you will receive an update on summer STEAM camps and learn about STEM achievements, current focus areas, and initiatives on the horizon. Following the success of last year's pilot, I'm pleased to announce the return of our summer STEAM enrichment camps. Once again this summer, Heinz Middle School will transform into the NMPS STEAM Center, providing an ideal location for the STEAM enrichment camps. The target audience for the camps is rising third through 12th grade students. Our goal is to offer an engaging enrichment experience, allowing students to apply the foundational skills learned during the academic year to solve rigorous real world problems while working alongside college, university, and industry mentors. The camps will run from July 10th to the 28th, Monday through Thursday, with student hours from 9.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Each camp is limited to 50 campers. We will utilize an electronic application for signups. The application will be posted on the Newport News Public Schools website, and families will be notified when the application becomes available on or before April 28th. If a camp receives more registrations than available seats, we will implement a lottery process for selecting participants. The slide provides a list of the camps covering a diverse range of innovative STEM topics that we are excited to offer this year. Starting with STEM achievements, I'm pleased to share that we have established a Division STEM Advisory Board comprised of 20 internal and external stakeholders. The board's mission is to provide equitable access to innovative and diverse STEM learning experiences that empower students with the knowledge, mindset, and skills necessary for success in careers of the future. In just a short few months, the board has connected opportunities with students and begun identifying connections between curriculum and careers. The key component of our STEM success has been empowering our school-based STEM leaders. Each school has a dedicated STEM lead teacher responsible for advancing STEM in their school as part of the school's instructional leadership team. To further support these leaders, we increased compensation from $950 to $2,500 for the lead teacher position. This year, we are excited to announce the launch of a new pilot program that expanded the iSTEM Related Arts course to the elementary level. The course is now being offered at a total of 14 schools and the Virtual Learning Academy. As part of the pilot program, 3,193 students are enrolled in the elementary course at seven Title I schools. Additionally, 1,742 students are enrolled in the iSTEM course at the middle school level building on the success of the program initiated a couple of years ago. The iSTEM Related Arts course features a research-backed curriculum with a strong emphasis on engineering and computer science and is designed to support science and computer science Virginia standards of learning. By participating in the iSTEM elective from grades kindergarten through eighth grade, students will experience 25 unique STEM careers through an engaging and immersive project-based curriculum. Our current focus areas include cultivating a hands-on, minds-on, STEM-centric learning environment in every school. To achieve this, we have made a significant investment in makerspace carts for each NMPS school. The makerspace carts will help overcome one of the main obstacles in STEM teaching, access to materials and tools. The, the sorry. The makerspace carts will help us overcome one of the obstacles, which is essential materials and tools. On the carts, the carts are differentiated by level, and they include items such as cardboard engineering tools, sets of gears, circuitry items, and woodcraft materials. Managed and replenished by the STEM lead teacher using their yearly STEM budget, these carts are now readily available for all teachers to utilize. With their easy mobility, the carts can be conveniently wheeled into any classroom ensuring an immersive and engaging STEM learning experience for all students. 
By focusing on engaging existing partnerships and establishing new ones, we continue to strengthen our STEM magnet programs. We have collaborated with our partners to align specialized programming to the unique needs of the STEM magnet programs at Discovery STEM Academy, Newsom Park, Crittenden Middle School, and Heritage High School. This collaborative approach fosters a well-rounded support system for our STEM magnet schools. As we continue to move forward in enhancing computer science literacy in compliance with the State of Virginia SOL requirements, we have made progress in professional learning. During the current school year, the instructional staff at 20 elementary and middle schools have completed computer science professional development, and the remaining elementary and middle schools will complete training in the coming weeks. In support of the computer science SOLs in grades K-8, 120 lessons have been added to the NMPS curriculum, ensuring coverage of each computer science standard. We are also proud to announce that through the recently awarded Computer Science for Middle School Regional Grant, in partnership with Old Dominion University, eight middle school teachers will have the opportunity to obtain micro-credentials in computer science. This collaboration strengthens our commitment to fostering computer science literacy in our schools. In 2019, NMPS received the One Community Transformation Grant awarded by Newport News Shipbuilding to support access to STEM innovations. This funding enabled NMPS to contract with ODU's Virginia Modeling Analysis and Simulation Center to develop a digital game that emerges that immerses third through eighth grade students in computer science concepts aligned with STEM careers at the shipyard. The game, called Coastal Coders, Adventures in Computer Science, is designed to resemble Roblox and Minecraft, ensuring a captivating experience for our students. Coastal Coders will have an initial beta release this May. To ensure a smooth rollout, we have hired two NMPS STEM teachers who have been part of the feedback team as curriculum developers and will also engage NMPS high school students as Career Pathways interns to play the game in beta mode, ironing out any bugs before deploying, deploying the game for broad student use. I am also pleased to announce the return of our flagship program, STEM the flagship STEM Community Day event, in partnership with Christopher Newport University on May 20th, 2023 at the Freeman Center. This year, each NMPS school will showcase STEM integration through hands-on activities. The event will feature a division-wide engineering design challenge for fourth through 12th grade students and a new Girls Who Code event, emphasizing diversity in STEM. Attendees can explore interactive exhibits from, STEM or from different STEM organizations, businesses, professionals, and educational institutions, gaining insights into innovations and opportunities in the field. And to round out the event, the first robotics showcase and competition will highlight students' engineering and programming skills through their innovative robotics creations. And that concludes this evening's STEM report. Are there any questions? Any questions this evening? Yeah. Um, I don't have questions, I just have a comment. Mm -hmm. um, I really like seeing the, the update and the information on the, the middle school STEM courses, because having a ninth grader, I remember when he got into sixth grade, he did the variety pack. Of, and mm -hmm. so this was three years, this might have been when this was rolling out and really enjoyed the STEM aspect of it to the extent that he took it as an elective each year thereafter. So I think this is a really great thing and to be rolling it into elementary is, it's really captivating to some stu a lot of students. So I think it's great. Yes. I have one question for the yes. STEM, their lead teachers. Mm -hmm. So is there like minimum requirements for the STEM lead teachers as far as projects and then do they have the liberty to do above and beyond what how does that work so yes they serve in a very similar leadership role as other leads mm -hmm. and they do have special projects and they do lead other projects assigned by their principal some examples of those are the stem nights 
Um, when community partners send us information about you know a competition coming up or something that we would like them to take advantage of really the stem lead teacher is the gateway to the students because when that email comes to my inbox there has to have somewhere to go that's connected directly with students who they can reach out and take that opportunity so really the stem lead is an integral part of not only just the job responsibilities of the professional development that they lead and um, and the things that they learn at their monthly meetings, they're really the, the, they're the vessel for being able to connect st students with opportunities. Okay. For the STEM day at CNU, mm -hmm. did y'all have it last year? Was it last year, year before? Because I went mm -hmm. one time, I just remember lots of people and everybody was having a good time. I, that's what I, so was that last year? So that was the one, it's actually, we have not held STEM Community Day since 2019. Oh, okay. So we are very excited to bring okay. that back. Well, I know? went to the last one you had. It oh, was well, really that's, nice. That's, really you know, the schools, and that's another example. Mm -hmm. That's the lead teachers that come out and represent their school and everything with STEM at their school. So that's actually another great example of one of their responsibilities and something that they lead. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yes, it's I love good. the fact that you're having a partnership with the different universities. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's excellent. That should be happening across the board. So thank you for that. You're welcome. I'll actually just add something to that. Um, William and Mary was one of our partners last year, and we had so many students that actually changed their major from a STEM major to education because they were just so inspired by working with their students. They were really supposed to be industry side-by-side -side mentors. That's what we want. It, but then next thing you know, they said, I think I love the teaching aspect of this too. So it's been powerful. Thank you. Anybody on this end? Okay. Well, you know, I get excited and giddy every time we're talking about STEM in our district. So thank you so much. I am very excited about these, uh, these new endeavors and the ones that we get to continue. So that's wonderful. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you all. And Katie Sheehan Smith will be is up next and she'll uh, present the report on visual and performing arts. Good evening, Chairman Searles Law, Vice Chair Dr. Bess, members of the board, Dr. Mitchell. I am Katie Sheehan Smith, your Visual and Performing Arts Supervisor. It's my pleasure to highlight some of the amazing things happening in our programs. So last month at Downing Gross Cultural Arts Center, we showcased the citywide youth art exhibit in alignment with the Virginia Art Educators Association Youth Art Month, affectionately called YAM. While most teachers took advantage of the gift of the e-commute day from the board, our art teachers gathered at Downing Gross to organize the display and engage in their annual professional development of analyzing the art pieces, ensuring alignment across grade levels, project-based idea shares, and general admiration for the talents of our students across the division. This year, Dr. Best joined us for the official ribbon cutting ceremony to kick off Youth Art Month with the Youth Art Citywide Exhibit, which remained on display throughout February. Also during YAM, three special Newport News students had the opportunity to travel to the state capitol and have their work recognized by Senator Monty Mason as Newport News took three of the four title awards from his annual art contest. Gracie Pruitt, Sierra Leone, and Jabrea Copeland, alongside their teachers, were treated to a truly special day touring the state capitol and being recognized on the Senate floor. And we rounded out YAM with prefaces, the student art show in partnership with the Torgler Center at CNU. Five total recognitions were awarded to Newport News Public School students, Jabrea Copeland, Akela Galbraith, Kristen Mensa, Apollo Chang, and the coveted Best in Show Award to Amelia Levin. A variety of other small school showings colored our town during Youth Art Month, dubbing our hashtag NNPS Arts. It was our fifth graders who filled the Ferguson Center for the Arts to kick off March as Music in Our Schools Month. A partnership with the Virginia Symphony Orchestra and Carnegie Hall, fifth, grader, fifth grade teacher spent weeks teaching songs and recorder parts in preparation for this interactive field trip. And what an engaging experience it was to see their little eyes light up walking into that big theater. 
March is music madness. That is for sure. And as you can see here, the NNPS Music Bracket is hosting not 49 performances this month. So busted all of everybody's brackets there. <laughs> While a lot of our schools have chosen to host their concerts in correlation with music in our school's month for March, I could continue on with a graphic night, not quite as high, but still up there with music performance, performances that will continue through the remainder of the school year. It's easy to quote you a total number, but I want to emphasize the importance of the weeks and the months of planning and preparation that it takes for any of these music events to occur. For any music program to be truly successful, it is in fact a community commitment. The at-home practice and attendance at the after-school ensemble rehearsals are essential for the development of successful musicians at any level. And like our testing and core contents, music programs also go up against a rigorous assessment process outlined by the Virginia Music Educators Association. NNPS is classified in District 8 of VMEA. I get a lot of acronyms going on here. <laughs> VMEA is, for, is the music education equivalent to VHSL for sports participation. And as early as October, our high school bands will compete in marching assessments. The skill and precision and blend of sound is rooted in quality that is relevant far beyond entertainment at the football game. General effect, marching and maneuvering, and music quality are all evaluated during fall marching assessments. As we move into early winter, students become individually assessed when they attend district auditions. Using a state standard rubric, students who exceed the baseline criteria are invited to participate in the district ensemble groupings and train with qualified conductors from outside of our region. Top ranking students from district ensembles are also able to audition for all state honors in which Newport News had more than 10 students qualify this year. Throughout the month of March, band, chorus, and orchestra ensembles will attend their concert state assessments to be evaluated by a panel of judges this time. Directors have their choice of the VMEA literature library, which are music selections that have been graded based on their level of difficulty. Multiple pieces are prepared for the stage performance, and additionally, groups are evaluated on their ability to sight read a selection of music that they have never seen before. These combined scores make up a school's state rating based on the VMEA five-point scale shown on the, on the slide. And our bands will have their panel adjudications this, later this week, but I am NNPS proud to share with you the orchestra and chorus state assessment results for 2023. Lots of superiors and excellence there. Very proud of them. And of course, it wouldn't be fair if I didn't mention our theater and dance programs to round out the visual and performing arts in Newport News. There is never a question of meeting seat times or hours of requirements for us as performance-based classes, teachers and students are regularly seen after school preparing for their next event, concert or performance. So we certainly hope that you will mark your calendars and be sure to support one of the next concert, music or visual arts performances at your home school. This concludes our monthly update. I'll take any questions if you have them. I have a comment. Yes. Comment. So I'm just so excited. Could you send the board that yes. slide? I can. <laughs> yes, I but I already have my tickets to Dare. So oh, I will good. be there Friday night. I will. So I'm excited That's about that. Good. Thank yes. you so very much. Any other comments? You took mine. <laughs> Thank you. I was just going to say yeah. that um, the students' art at the Torgler Center is amazing we went because there was an Ansel Adams exhibit I didn't mm -hmm. even realize it was there and we mm -hmm. got distracted and then yeah. checked out all the high school there was some wonderful artwork by our students and yeah. other local students as well so if you haven't gone I encourage you to check it out and the Twerkler yeah. Center and CNU have been really active in sending me professional development opportunities for the teachers as well so there's a couple of different workshops that they've done with their guest artists there at the Twerkler oh, Center really cool. that they've been able to take advantage of for free so we thank them as well oh that's wonderful mm -hmm. news exciting any other comments or questions? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. We are going to move on to item 5.02, the resolution. It's a proposed settlement of opioid-related claims. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, I think we're going to have a presentation. Yes. Thank you again. We're going to ask Lynn Wallen 
to come up to the podium. He is, of course, our attorney for Newport News Public Schools, and he's going to provide an overview of the proposed settlement of opioid-related claims. Thank you, Mr. Wallen. Good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and Dr. Mitchell. I've been asked to provide a brief report related to the resolution intended to approve the school division's participation in proposed opioid claim settlements, which have been negotiated by the Virginia Attorney General's Office with several national firms listed in the resolution. You are all probably aware of public reports related to nationwide opioid epidemic. This epidemic has cost thousands of lives across the country, and it affects the Commonwealth of Virginia and its political subdivisions by adversely impacting the delivery of emergency medical, law enforcement, criminal justice, mental health, and substance abuse services. Virginia has made claims against major firms which it believes bear shared responsibility for the opioid epidemic. If the claims are settled, the settlement funds are transferred to the Virginia Opioid Abatement Authority. This independent authority was established by the General Assembly in 2021, and its purpose is to abate and remediate the opioid epidemic in Virginia. The authority does its work by providing financial support in the form of grants, donations, or other assistance for efforts to treat, prevent, and reduce opioid use disorder and the misuse of opioids in Virginia. Some of these funds go directly to localities. The resolution before you is similar to one approved in 2021, December, which authorized participation in settlement agreements against a different set of major companies. Although school divisions do not directly receive payments from settlement funds, it is my understanding that settlement negotiation and resolution of claims are facilitated by including hospitals and major Virginia school divisions in settlements. In practical terms, approval of the resolution means that the school division will be releasing any potential claims it might have against the companies cited in the resolution. The last time settlement negotiations were initiated, all 133 counties and cities in Virginia, the nine largest Virginia towns, and the 11 largest Virginia school districts participated in the settlements. The Attorney General's Office, which is doing the negotiations, hopes for the same level of participation in the latest settlement cases. Claim settlements are significant because settlements could result in Virginia's receipt of approximately $426 million based on the settlements which would be approved pursuant to the resolution. Ms. Spratley and I recommend your approval of the resolution and also recommend that you move this to action and approve it tonight. Uh, the steps that have to be taken to uh, implement the settlements require documents to be executed and submitted no later than April the 18th. That's your last, that's your next meeting date. So we couldn't approve it on that date and have the settlement forms uh, executed and submitted in a proper form. So if you have questions, we'll try to answer them. Are there questions? Yes, yes Mr. Brown. Question um, here, because we said that uh, there's no direct payment to the school division and it's the state of Virginia or the Virginia Attorney General who is um, pursuing this action. So it brings up the question, what does this have to do with us and uh, why, is our, why is our approval needed or required? I think the answer to that question is, um, at least in, th in theoretical terms, school divisions could pursue similar actions against the firms that are listed in the resolution. And the firms, when they're negotiating settlements with the Attorney General's office would like to be assured that if they settle with cities and counties, they won't th thereafter be pursued by school divisions. It would be really difficult for individual school divisions to prove damages in a case like this anyway, and so it's, it's more theoretical than practical, but the, the direct answer is that the firms that are negotiating with the Attorney General's office really don't want to negotiate unless we participate, and they're asking, the Attorney General's office is asking the 11 largest Virginia school divisions, which would be the, the largest sums of money, but theoretically, 
to participate. And that's what happened last time. Um, every city and county participated, the 11 largest towns, and uh, the 11 largest school divisions. But, then, but you know, last so in, but in 2021, we got nothing, right? Correct. Or, okay. so, and um, and we, we will we're directly, likely to get nothing. We will directly get nothing in this case, because <laughs> what you're doing is um, to facilitate the settlement of the cases, school divisions are waiving their ability to file their own lawsuit. wanting to work together. Um, I make note that uh, the city did receive, um, has received payments under the last settlement mm -hmm. um, um, in reference to the resolution that you all uh, issued in December of 2021. And so the city has received payments and does expect to receive payments under this upcoming settlement. So no, the school board won't receive payments. But in the in that the city and the school board are trying to work together, um, the city will be responsible. And that's that that brings up that's the um, important point uh, that I would like to emphasize here is does the city, um, the city council, city manager's office acknowledge our participation, and have they made that request explicitly? Because I haven't I haven't personally heard from any council members on a request for this to facilitate. Um, them receiving this this funds and so it's one of those things of want to just make sure that they're aware um, of our assistance in this matter and that it's yeah. it's noted as, as being a helpful partner because I, I just haven't heard any requests and are any requests forthcoming from them to, to request our participation in this for something we don't really need to do I, I think the direct answer to that is that the city attorney has been dealing with the Attorney General's office dealing with um, both the school division and the city and it's really been facilitated through the city attorney's office who of course represents in some respects both the school division and the city mm -hmm. the, the city by the way approved the, their resolution February the 28th so okay. this would be the last step for the city to be involved with the, the settlements all right. Additional questions? Sure. Thank Comments? You. Yes. Yes, Madam Chairman. I, I mean, Chairwoman, I think we should also, as a board, make sure we have emphasis on, you know, because the city did receive funds last time we did this. I don't know if they transferred any to us. Probably not. <laughs> My understanding is that the funds are to be used for opioid um, um, prevention related initiatives. Okay, at the, at the city level? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. I just want to add this impacts our families mm -hmm. am i correct in our community well, absolutely i mean it's and it's it's the I'm the things i listed you know right. social services uh, emergency medical services etc all that affects individual citizens and kids in the schools divisions so even though we don't get money directly there's certainly benefit that's derived that's by right. families in the mm -hmm. in newport news yes that was going to be my comment is that um, it does help our families in the city um, and we end up with the students in our in our buildings and this uh, if this is a way that we can help support in this crisis I think it is uh, worth taking it to vote so and it's a significant sum of money yes so since it needs to be in by April 18th uh, may I have a motion to move the opioid related claims resolution to action? Madam Chair, I move to move 5.02 proposed settlement of opioid related claims resolution to action. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Any question? Please call the roll. Harris. Four. 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 Alger. Four. Amon. Four. Best. Four. Brown? Four. Searles Law? Four. Motion carries to move 5.02 to action, and now you would need a motion to approve the actual resolution. Yes. May I have a motion to approve the resolution? Madam Chair, I move to approve the opioid related claims resolution as presented. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. 
Any question? Uh, Madam Chair, <clears throat> as I alluded to in my questions that I was offering up, oftentimes when we go and we're talking to our partners in uh, City Council and making negotiations and asking for funding to support the schools, there is often the case of, hey, what have you, what have you done for us? And I think it oftentimes goes without notice. Um, it does, certainly doesn't go without saying, but it sometimes goes without notice, the types of actions and things that we do do to support the city. Uh, and so I just wanna make sure that uh, we're making a concerted effort to make sure that the uh, city council and city manager know that we are actively um, taking steps that support them and support them, uh, their ability to go after grants and get funding and um, get settlements and we help with land and, and other things of that nature so that when we go and we're talking in the budget and asking for things that it's not met with, but well, what have you done for us? Uh, so this is a, yet, yet tonight a thing that we're doing largely for, um, it, it helped for the whole city, but uh, it's not, it's not necessarily for us. We're not going to benefit from this. Yeah. Well, I, hear, I hear my charge. I will make sure we are articulating our support in that regard. Any other questions? Please call the roll. Harris. Four. Hunter. Four. Alger. Four. Amen. Four. Best. Four. Brown. Four. Searles Law. Four. Motion carries seven zero. Okay. Thank you. So we have our 5.04 is the attendance report. We've got our oh, special education. Did I, who did I miss? Oh, she, we made an adjustment on it. 5.04 is the attendance report. 5.05 .05 is the membership report. 5.06 is the construction report. Uh, board members, you have received copies of these reports. Are there any questions? Will we be hearing the, not on those, but will we be hearing report. on the special education or no? It's 5.03. Oh, I see. I uh -huh. did. I got you. Mm -hmm. We'll move to item 5.03, the special education annual plan. <laughs> Dr. Mitchell, who do we have speaking with us tonight? <laughs> I don't blame you. It is. <laughs> it is. It, I apologize. Madam Chair, uh, this evening, Vivian Vitulo, Director of Special Education, will share the proposed spending plan that helps to fund and support part of our special education programs. Ms. Vitulo. Good evening, Chairman Searles Law, Vice Chairman Best, Board Members, and Dr. Mitchell. Tonight's presentation is an annual requirement to inform the Board of the proposed spending plan for funds allocated by the federal government based on the requirements outlined in the application. Local education agencies are required to submit this application each year pursuant to the federal provisions of the Individuals with Disabilities Act of 2004, as well as the state regulations governing special education and related services to students with disabilities. Prior to the submission of the plan, the Virginia Department of Education requires that the local division present its plan to the local school board for approval and for review by their local special education advisory committee. We are required to assure that we are providing a free appropriate public education, that each student's program is designed for them and is documented on an IEP, and that students are educated in an inclusive environment to the extent that their educational programming permits. Finally, we must maintain a structure that prevents the over-identification of students in special education in general or in specific categories. We currently serve students in each of the 13 disability categories. Our federal funding is based on the number of students with disabilities being served on December 1. On December 1, 2022, we were serving a total of 3,653 students with disabilities. Currently, we are serving 3,693 students, which reflects an increase of students since December 1. Oops, sorry. In addition to the assurances, the annual plan requires that the division submit information on expenditures and some selected programs. For maintenance of effort, we make sure we are spending the same amount on special education supports as we did the previous year, or spend more, but never less. Included in the selected programs is the local jail program where services are provided by endorsed special education teachers to students with disabilities who are currently incarcerated. 
Another component of the plan is the supports for students with disabilities parentally placed in private schools, including homeschooled students for which we offer special education services. It is important to note that the administrators from the private schools collaborate with our staff to identify the provisions of special education services to be made available to the parentally placed student. In previous years, the decision has been to offer speech language services to those students who are found eligible. In addition, we collaborate with these programs to offer professional development and assist families with child find. The last component is the funding expenditures. It is separated into two sections, Title VI-B for pre-K through 12th grade and Title VI-C for preschool special education only. State and federal local funding support the special education program in its entirety. Title VI-B and Title VI-C represent nearly $7.1 million of the overall funding. We are proposing to continue to utilize this funding for personnel, including a parent resource coordinator, which is required by the state, and extended school year services for those qualifying students. Approximately 126 positions are supported by this grant. I would like to close out this presentation by sharing some of the highlights from the Student Advancement Department during the 2022-2023 school year. We introduced the Special Education PD on Demand Canvas course series with content for teachers, administrators, instructional assistants, and long-term substitutes that can be accessed at their convenience 24-7. The course material includes reputable and focused multimedia content from Student Advancement Leadership as well as state and nationally recognized special education organizations. We are working with our fourth cohort of special education teachers in residency. We continue to grow the program in an effort to recruit, recruit and retain quality special education teachers. Currently, we are in the process of interviewing candidates for the fifth cohort who will be with us for the 2023-2024 school year. Special education teachers continue to participate in the training on language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling, commonly known as letters. Letters training instructs teachers in what literacy skills need to be taught, why, and how to plan to teach them, delving into the research base behind these recommendations. This year, elementary teachers and early childhood special education teachers have participated in the year-long training. Additionally, Student Advancement collaborated with school-based staff to complete the Inclusive School Self-Assessment and Action Plan for our division, which included input from school-based and central office staff. I also want to highlight, hmm, did I go too far? <laughs> there we go. I also want to highlight our community partnerships. Through Project Search and in partnership with Centera and Fort Eustis, we are able to provide our students with authentic, authentic experiences to develop workplace skills. Interns participating in these programs boast a success rate of nearly 90% in gaining competitive employment upon completion of their internship. One student from this year's cohort has already been offered a position at Fort Eustis, and a second student is in the process of being hired. Our partnerships with community agencies provide an additional layer of opportunities. Through versatility, our students, students have been able to participate in the Future of Work program, which offers training in both welding and culinary, culinary arts at no cost to the student. Graduates from, graduates from the welding program have been able to obtain full-time employment at Newport News Shipbuilding. Our partnership with the Department of Aging and Rehabilitative Services, known as DARS, enables us to provide our students with both virtual and in-person participation in their career exploration program, through which students explore career interests, develop independent living skills, and complete a vocational assessment. We also continue to partner with the Special Education Training and Technical Assistance Centers at Old Dominion University and the College of William & Mary to provide our staff with targeted professional development in the areas of literacy, math, positive behavior supports, and assistive technology. Oops, I'm pressing the wrong one, my apologies. During our next board meeting on April 18th, we'll be seeking your approval of the proposed plan and we'll submit it to the Virginia Department of Education no later than May 12th. Your approval of this plan will enable us to continue providing staff to support the continued growth of our students with disabilities. 
This concludes my presentation. I'm happy, happy to provide additional information if needed. Ms. Alger? Yes, um, child find, do we have funding for yes, that? Yes, Okay, because I didn't mean. That is I included, um, and we've, that goes, so our uh, title, we both use the title uh, 6C, represents part of that and title. The, this, the funds that we get for the, uh, from this plan are primarily for personnel, okay. but we use funding for child find, and that's included also in the um, uh, set aside that we do for um, private parentally placed students. Okay. okay. And the local budget also supports child find. Supports child find as well. Find as yes. well. Okay, and that's um, and that program is available all year round, or is that something that is um, you know during a certain time of child time? Yeah, all year round. All year round. Okay. 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 Other comments or questions? Thank you for a very comprehensive report, and thank you for loaning your fearless leader to the oh. good <laughs> of the entire division. Yes. Thank you for holding it down for us. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I have already read this part. We're, we're moving on <laughs> to the attendance report, the membership report. The construction report board members I know you've received a copy of these are there any questions at this time so one more time tonight uh, I will check to see if we have any additional cards no ma'am okay and then one more time tonight we will hear from dr. Mitchell <laughs> thank you madam chair I will begin my comments this evening by sharing that our thoughts and prayers continue to be with our colleague, Abby Zorner. We continue to lift her up. Please do the same. Earlier this evening, we recognized the Woodside High School uh, State Champions. We also want to acknowledge and congratulate our other champion student athletes who will join us for recognition at next month's board meeting. We do wanna say congratulations to Heritage Standout Madison White for capturing the state championship and setting a meet record in the 55 meter dash at the state indoor and field championship meet. Her fellow uh, heritage star, my, 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 say it again, my, 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 my son, Johnny. Uh, Solomon, who earned the state championship in the 55 meter, her, meter hurdles. Uh, Sane and Sabria, I believe they're siblings, Wooden, uh, my, my Jana, I got it this time, Solomon and Madison White brought home the state championship and meet, uh, set a meet record in the 4x4 100 relay. <laughs> During the swim and dive state championships, Menchville swimmer Ian Rogers captured the state title in the 100 fly. And another Menchville student athlete, Cassie Daughtry. Daughtry was named the state girls wrestling champion. So we have a lot of students that we're super proud of. I also want to thank everyone who participated in the March Madness event this past Saturday at Warwick High School. The event was hosted by family and the family and community engagement team, and it focused on math and physical fitness. Nearly 100 people were in attendance, 900, 900, 900. people were in attendance and enjoyed an elementary math competition, exploration stations, a basketball clinic, community vendors, and a basketball invitational. So we wanna thank all who attended and supported this event. We congratulate our family engagement team for coordinating and hosting another successful event. The 2023 Tidewater Regional Odyssey of the Mind Tournament was also held on Saturday. We have a lot going on mm -hmm. at Menchville High School. 34 teams from across the region competed in the tournament. The first in-person competition since COVID. We do want to congratulate teams from McIntosh Elementary, Nowood Meadows Elementary and Booker T. Washington Middle School for earning first place in their problem and division. They are advancing to compete in the Virginia Odyssey of the Mind State Finals 
uh, April 15th in Northern Virginia. So another great accomplishment. Yes. Congratulations are also in order for the Katherine Johnson Elementary Drum Line Crimson Thunder. Yes. And I believe tonight our students that were here were a part of that. Mm -hmm. The drum line was invited to participate in the battle in the Apple in New York this past weekend. Drum line gave a stellar performance and earned two awards. First place in the junior division, and they received the most votes for the fan favorite award. <laughs> Please check out the Crimson Thunder's performance. The video is posted on our website. Last week, each of our new advisory committees held their first meetings, the family engagement, school safety, and the rights and responsibilities at, uh, advisory committees were well attended and engaging. Over the next several weeks, the advisory committees will continue to meet and formulate recommendations. I want to take a moment to thank our parents, staff, and the community for their interest and support of Newport News Public Schools. We had over 500 people to apply to one or more of the advisory committees. So unfortunately, uh, with such a great response, we could not accept everyone. I do encourage those who apply to stay tuned. There will be other opportunities for your valued input. We, we will retain your information for further consideration. Our Community Relations Department has launched a campaign featuring our students who are making a difference in our communities. The student campaign includes billboards across our city, so please be looking out for them. Social media posts, stills in Newport News Public Schools TV, twice weekly ads in the Daily Press newspaper, so those of you who get the Daily Press, digital ads on dailypress.com and ads in the Oyster Pointer and Virginia Peninsula Magazine. I know I've had a lot to say, but as Mr. Gary Hunter says, great things are happening in Newport News. <laughs> and lastly, a reminder for students and families, on Friday, March the 31st, all students dismiss half day, and April 3rd to the 7th is spring break. All schools and offices will be closed. Monday, April the 10th, schools are closed for students. It is a teacher planning day, and I certainly wish everyone a happy and safe spring break. And I'm just gonna take a little liberty because of what you said to Vivian Batulo, and I'm gonna ask the Department of Student Advancement to stand, and we thank you for coming out to support. <laughs> Please stand. <laughs> Again, thank you. Thank you very much. So we are going to um, move on to perhaps some board comments. We are getting close to that hour that you all, I see you looking side-eyeing me. Um, <laughs> but I do definitely want to give Ms. Manadero the opportunity to address us this evening. Really happy to see like everything that's happening behind my um, education. Um, I wasn't able to see it like the first three years, but now it's really interesting to see what happens behind it all. Um, and then for Sage, um, we've finally been able to get rolling our student exchange. So it's gonna be like um, they're gonna be partnering up and then shadowing each other at their schools. And so hopefully we'll be able to get that um, done by um, mid-April. And then um, at our Sage meeting, meeting, we'll be able to share how everything went. Um, Dr. Mitchell, you mentioned um, the Rights and Responsibilities Committee. I believe we had two students from our stage group who um, attended that, and hopefully we'll be able to hear from them tomorrow when we have our stage meeting then. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, and we appreciate you being part of the work we're doing. Thank you. Does any other board member have a burning comment that they would really <laughs> like to make? I think we're going to end on a great note. We're, oh, you do. Okay, yes. yes. Uh, I, I want to thank you uh, for all of the hard work uh, that you've done behind the scenes, mm -hmm. especially to get this budget uh, passed with Ms. Mento. Um, thank you as well. That was huge. So thank you. Thank you. I have my notebook. I will save it for next year. <laughs> so meeting adjourned. Thank you all. all right.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.